Welcome to ABC 24 This Week. I'm Richard Ransom. Hope you're having a nice holiday season as we finish the last weekend before Christmas. We're here to talk about the real story behind the big stories. And here's what's on our plate for today. Frazier back in the fold. We learned this week that four Frazier schools that had been taken over by the state will now be folded back into the Shelby County school system right where they had been 10 years ago. But we also learned only one of the four schools is better off than it was four years ago, at least academically. What does that say about Tennessee's achievements school district or ASD. Democrats want to be district attorney. In fact, now three Dems have their eyes on the race to be Shelby County's top prosecutor. But are they only making it easier for incumbent Amy Wyrick to win re-election? And redistricting remorse. It looks like Democrats will be losing a House seat at the state capitol in Nashville. They're not happy with how Republicans are drawing the lines, but shouldn't they instead be looking in the mirror? We'll get into all of that in just a moment, but first let me introduce my panel to you. Right to my left is Otis Sanford, uh, ABC 24 political analyst, and also joining us remotely uh, via Zoom is uh, Sam um, Hardiman, sorry Sam, commercial appeal reporter, and Reverend Ken Whalen, New Olive at Worship Center, who is a frequent guest of our program as well. So thanks to all, as all of you for being here. Let's talk about the, uh, the Frazier situation first. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Joris Ray, the Shelby County Superintendent, was very excited to have all these uh, four schools back into the fold, as I said, Frazier, Corning, Whitney, and Georgian Hills, uh, some 800 students and their families back into the uh, Shelby County school system. That's some $8 million, by the way, if not more, uh, for SCS. Georgian Hills, though, was the only one that academically had performed uh, good enough that it would have left the ASD anyway. The only reason the other three uh, are no longer uh, takeover schools is because their time is up, basically. They've been taken over by the state uh, for some 10 years, and it's in the charter that after 10 years, uh, the, the, the state can release its hold on those schools. Um, Reverend Ken, you're, you're our education advocate uh, on the panel today. What are your thoughts about ASD as a whole and how it's doing? Because there seem, uh, seems to be a lot of disappointment all around when it comes to their performance. Well, the ASD, and I'm not trying to cast aspersion on the people who were in charge of ASD, but ASD and others uh, were acronyms, just lovely, beautiful acronyms to, that stand for such beautiful thoughts and lofty ideals. But the bottom line of public education, of education anyway, is to, you know, educate the children. Uh, and as you can see, the three schools who did not measure up academically, but who had reached the end of the financial timeline, are just back with Shelby County Schools with still no solution in sight. Um, Richard, it is an unfortunate state of affairs for all of public education. And I think that we, we are doing our kids a disservice by allowing the media and others to continue to compartmentalize public education as if ASD was something separate and apart from uh, Shelby County Schools. The state of Tennessee, the governor of the state of Tennessee, is responsible for educating all of our children. And if ASD has failed, the governor has failed. Well, let's hear from uh, school board member Stephanie Love of SCS. Uh, her children were enrolled in uh, those some of those Fraser schools that were affected that are now back in the SES. And she kind of alludes to the turmoil that's caused families uh, to have kids lifted from one school system and placed in another and all of uh, the changes that meant, including changes of uh, leadership at the school and teachers and, and the like. Let's listen. People don't like when I use the word hostile takeover. But as a parent, that's what it felt like the things in the past that happened that we did not get right, ensuring that those things are first acknowledged and a corrective action plan is put into place. But our children who lost those years, they can't get those years back. And board member Love is uh, very passionate because th that's the reason she became a school board member is the way this whole thing was handled. And uh, she calls it a hostile takeover, but that's how a lot of parents felt, Otis. Absolutely, and, and you know, I'm, I'm really glad to see um, p parents like Stephanie Love sitting on the school board because they have an absolute stake in what goes on uh, in these schools. Um, uh, uh, Ken is absolutely right on everything that he said. Uh, you know, uh, there were lofty goals uh, for the Achievement School District when it started uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, that was more PR uh, than reality. Uh, and it's clear that 10 years later, we haven't seen any noticeable uh, improvement there except for that one school, uh, I think of Georgian Hills, Georgian Hills. I think what you mentioned. Uh, and, and so that's, that speaks to 
just uh, uh, some smoke and mirrors here. Uh, I'm sure that they were trying, uh, but there's a lot that goes into educating kids, especially in some communities. And the, we spent a lot of time, my wife and I spent a lot of time in Fraser because she, her ministry works out there. Uh, and we understand the issues that are faced uh, every day by parents and families in that community. And unless you have a schools and, and, and various schools who are addressing the issues that go beyond the classroom, you're not gonna be that effective. And so I'm sort of glad to see that these schools are going back to SCS and, and, and maybe there's some, going to be some real corrective action, as Stephanie Love says, to make sure that these students continue to get the education that they need. Still, you have the State Department of Education, Sam, that feels like it's got to be able to do something for the bottom performing 5% of schools within the state. And now, I guess next year, they're getting prepared to hire some super duper, all powerful <laughs> superintendent. The title's kind of a lame, but it's, it's a super superintendent, basically, who will uh, start to manage uh, some kind of reform within uh, a, a reimagined, I guess, uh, achievement school district. Uh, where is that going, do you think? be honest, Richard, I don't think I'm qualified to even uh, weigh in there. So I'll let Reverend Whalen, uh, <laughs> if he wants to get back in here, say something. <laughs> Reverend Whalen, I know you well, follow this pretty well, closely. As I was saying earlier, I gave the governor um, credit uh, a little bit earlier, some months ago, for his attempts to try to equalize the playing field for poor kids in Memphis and Shelby County and across the state. But the very thing that the governor was pushing, and that is the school choice vouchers, uh, people like Stephanie Love, with all due respect, and most Democrats opposed it. They rejected, saying it's it's unfair. Well, that's the only way poor black and Hispanic children are going to get out of the morass, the, the poor public education morass that they're in, to let the dollars follow the children, give the children the opportunity to attend school at any school they want to, any private school, any school whatsoever, so that we can at least, one by one, lift these children, Richard. We are in, we are seeing the results, the consequences of planting seeds with no desire to see them grow in a positive direction. You've been an advocate of charter schools, though, previously, and uh, it's, there's a mixed bag on that, isn't there, as far as how successful they've been? Obviously and, and absolutely. Now, the thing is, char some charter schools work, some don't. Some public schools, traditional public schools work, some don't. Some private schools work, some don't. That's the whole idea. The idea is to allow the dollars to follow the children, try to raise the level of pay, and security and safety for the teachers and staff and let the teachers teach. It doesn't matter what kind of school it is, charter, uh, traditional public, traditional private, uh, any kind of school, as long as we get our children out of this poverty, man, we are seeing with the case of, of Young Dolph and other just senseless violence across our city and county and nation, education is the key. But when you bring the politics in, and as Ken just did, uh, let's make sure that our viewers understand here. Uh, the Achievement School District started uh, under uh, Governor Haslam, as I recall, uh, and and he was, uh, you know, he was pushing this, and 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 he was well-meaning as a result of it. But I don't think Governor Haslam was all that much in favor of vouchers. Uh, the voucher push really started with Bill Lee. He was very fervent about it, uh, and but it and and I know Ken and I have a little bit of disagreement on this because I think that the voucher program um, was only geared toward Memphis and Nashville. A lot of other legislators across the state didn't want it, uh, and it was just sort of a, it, it went down a wrong path. That's why it's in trouble that it's in. Uh, but the bottom line here, whether you take the politics out of it or not, is that the emphasis should be on educating kids from every sector of this community. Uh, and if the Achievement School District can't do it, then let the Shelby County Schools do it, uh, and, and, and we'll just see what, what, what happens after that. One thing I wanted to do bring you in on, Sam, and hopefully you feel okay, this is in your, your wheelhouse, but we know that there's just so much money floating around right now for school systems, all over government for that matter, but you know, Shelby County Schools is looking at 500 million extra dollars than they might otherwise have, which would tr provide a tremendous opportunity, and just based upon you know, the politicians you, you talk to and what you're hearing from, is there a feeling that there's enough accountability uh, for how that money's being spent and is it being 
you know, spent wisely. I know there's been controversy about everything from $25 million for air filtration systems to what have you. Uh, what are you hearing about that? So I would defer to my colleague, Laura Testino, on her reporting on this. And I think that from what she's reported and what um, she and I have discussed is, I don't think that it's clear if there's enough transparency yet, or if this money when spent is going to have, is it clear that it's going to have the generational impact it has the potential to have? When you throw around these dollar figures at you know the Shelby County school level, at the Shelby County government level, at the city of Memphis level, it seems like a lot of money to us lay people. But then when you have these giant bureaucracies with these giant budgets, it's amazing how quickly money is swallowed up. And so I think that in hindsight, whether it's five years or 10 years, I hope there is an industrious reporter around to look and see, was this generational opportunity of one-time funds, was that acted on in an appropriate manner? And I, I don't think sitting here 14 days left of 2021, we have the answer to that question yet. Yeah, good point. Hey, Richard, I, we, can, we can get an answer to that question by just asking the superintendent about the graduation rate over the last 10 years or whatever window of time we want to look at. The bottom line of public education is to graduate children. And if an appreciably larger number of students are not graduating over the last 10 years, that means all that money is being wasted, period. Okay. All right, we've got to leave it there. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about all the Democrats who want to be Shelby County District Attorney in just a moment. Injured at Nahan Saharovich and Trots, we always work to get you lots. At a time when misinformation is all too common on social media, we take great pride in bringing you the news that matters, that impacts your family, news you can trust. Local broadcast journalists bring you the facts, covering the stories breaking in our community and across the globe. Text TV to 52886 and let Congress know you depend on local journalism. This message furnished by the National Association of Broadcasters. Oh yeah, dude, that doesn't look good. I know what to do. I'm going to castnetusa.com. I can apply minutes and if approved, I can have the money as soon as the same business day. Go to cashnetusa.com to apply for the money you need. I'm attorney Mike Montesi. Injured in a car wreck? I fight to get you what's yours. Call 526-2126. You putting yourself out on a limb protecting me. What happens if you get expelled? It's about fighting the system. This is your future. It's up to us to go out and carve our own paths. You may think protecting your teammates is noble, but you're going down for this. Back on ABC 24 this week to talk about the Shelby County DA's race. It's going to be a hot one, at least the Democratic primary side of it is looking to be, because we already have three announced candidates uh, for that Democratic primary. Uh, the most recent entrant is uh, Janika White, an attorney who has uh, connections to Walter Bailey and his firm. Uh, Steve Mulroy, who we all know was a Shelby County Commissioner and a, a U of M law professor. And Linda Harris, an attorney and also former uh, police officer. All three of those have uh, entered the fray. Uh, Ken, uh, I'm going to start with you again on this because I know you're following this very closely. You, in fact, are backing Janika White in this race. Uh, but what do you make of how it's shaping up so far? Because as I look at it, um, you might have uh, Harris and Janika White splitting up the African-American vote. Uh, in addition, Mulroy has the name recognition. It makes it hard for either one of those uh, talented women to, to win the nomination. I think it's going to be a test case uh, for Memphis and Shelby County politics. Uh, the, the term you used a moment ago, splitting up the vote among blacks, uh, is going to be, that's going to be the bellwether. That's going to be the, the telltale sign. Are we going to uh, grow and mature as a voting base? Are we going to look beyond color as white politicians tend to want us to do all the time? <laughs> but when it comes to blacks, we don't want to really talk about it. But are we going to allow intellect and experience and compassion to determine who we vote for, uh, and it remains to be seen. 
Uh, Janika White has, as you said, I'm, I'm supporting her, uh, but I think anybody who would just look at the record would see that she has a peculiar and particular ability uh, with compassion and with experience uh, with as being a partner in Walter Bailey's firm and, and being a known in this community. But the answer to your question, I don't know, man, is going to be difficult. Otis, uh, how do you assess the race? I think no one was happier to have, see three candidates uh, <laughs> enter the Democratic primary than uh, Amy Weirich. Well, that's true, although, you know, she's in her own primary, and uh, whoever comes out of that Democratic primary, she will face uh, in August, and the, Demo the primary is both Democrat and Republican uh, uh, will be in May. Um, I think that this is going to be a very interesting race, both in the primary and in the general, uh, because, uh, you know, the district attorney wields a lot of power in this community. They have a lot of face time with the public, uh, and it's vitally important who serves in that role. And yes, uh, Steve Mulroy has the name recognition in the broader Shelby County community, uh, but there are a lot of voters in this community who have been facing favoring women in, in, in elections lately. Uh, and that's certainly true with African-American women. So we, we'll just have to see here. I'm, I, I want to see how Steve Mulroy runs this race. Uh, he is certainly portraying himself as a very liberal person. He was certainly seen out on the picket line uh, a week or so ago with the uh, Kellogg, stri the strikers from uh, the Kellogg company. Uh, but, you know, that kind of issue is doesn't have anything to do with the district attorney's office. So we'll We'll just have to see how they campaign and if they can campaign, if they can raise some funds, if they can get their message out there and appeal to voters, it's going to be a really interesting race to watch both in May and in August. It's no mistake, Sam, that uh, Amy Weirich has positioned herself as tough on crime and she has lived up to that. In fact, has taken some serious criticism for being too tough uh, on crime, but you get the sense that a lot of people would rather have that uh, than someone who's soft on crime uh, and that's black or white voters. Yeah, I would, um, that Memphis and Shelby County Crime Commission poll that came out a few weeks ago that the city council is now facing the residency question again for police officers, in part justified by that poll, points to, you know, voters are pretty mixed on how they want the judicial branch to behave towards criminals or people that are accused of being criminals, I should say. And I think that if you talk to District Attorney General Wyrick, if you talk to Memphis Mayor Jim Strickland, they would argue and they would make the case that voters want to have someone that is, quote, tough on crime, whatever that means. District Attorney General Wyrick, Mayor Strickland have both been advocating for, quote, truth in sentencing, which is just really means less parole for those who are in jail. And back to both Otis and Reverend Whalum's point here about the race in the Democratic primary. I'm not sure it really matters how many people get in this primary versus the one-on-one -on -one that's gonna come out of it for the primary. What I'm curious in, and a lot of people that are veterans in Memphis politics say, is you have to win the boxes, you have to win the precincts. And I think that I'm really intrigued to see how each one of these candidates gets out and tries to win the most boxes, wins the most precincts. Because this is a race where I think, yes, money is gonna matter, but I think ground game is gonna matter a lot. Where are the yard signs? Who is winning You know the intersections down in Whitehaven and South Memphis? Because I think that is where this vote in the primary may turn. Interesting, That's I agree a good with you point. there. Yeah, yeah look, well, we only have about a minute left, uh, Sam. I do want you to weigh in on another story completely different that you've been covering, though, uh, recently, and that is uh, the situation involving MLGW as it collects uh, requests for proposals or RFPs from other suitors who might want to provide electricity uh, to uh, MLGW rather than the Tennessee Valley Authority. Problem is, those RFPs came in, but the public has no access to them, and we don't know uh, you know, they're, they're, they're keeping it under the vest right now. There's no transparency at all. What are your thoughts on that? Because they've taken, the utility's taken some heat on that in the last few days. Yeah, I would say um, former MLGW CEO and city attorney, Heron Morris, has definitely taken them to task in a letter to city council in recent weeks. And I think that the public should wait and see. The public doesn't always love to be patient. We in the media don't always love to be patient. But if we get to a point this summer where MLG and W is supposed to release the finalists of who they want to select for the bidding in the to provide electricity to Memphis, and then they maybe don't release that list or don't show us what 
those finalists have proposed, I think that's when we have a real opportunity to ask and raise some real transparency questions. Because throughout this process, people have wanted to know and to see the data, and it, it is worth it because this is the public's decision. This is the public's utility. This is maybe the most important decision facing Memphis and Shelby County over the next generation. So I think this summer, when MLG and W is scheduled to release these finalists, is when we really should be concerned about transparency and making sure we know what the bids are and what the price of electricity being offered the public is. All right, I know you'll stay on it. Oh, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about some redistricting controversy in just a moment. Overall, the last quarter has been a disaster. Corporate is not happy. Long story short, no bonuses. Look, it's a temporary setback, but we've got to tighten our belts. What are you doing? Transferring some emergency cash from my advanced financial flex loan in my bank account. While we're in a meeting? Yeah, managing my flex loan from advanced financial has never been easier. I can transfer cash anytime, anywhere. You know she can't stop it when- need you to pay attention. Yes, like him. Celebrate the season together with a holiday gift from Pandora Jewelry. You want fries with that? Introducing Wendy's new hot and crispy fries. Preferred almost two to one over McDonald's. Ah! Try them today, only at Wendy's. I'm Corey B. Trotz. Insurance companies know which personal injury law firms settle cases cheaply and which ones are prepared for trial. At Team NST, we have a proven track record of successfully trying cases to verdict each year. Call 683-7000. Back on ABC 24 this week with my panel, ABC 24 political analyst Otis Sanford, the commercial appeals Sam Hardiman, and Reverend Ken Whalen with New Olivet Worship Center. So I want to talk about this uh, redistricting controversy. Sam, you've been covering this, so we'll lead with you here. Uh, this is uh, basically affecting uh, districts 90 and 91, and why don't you give folks a little background on what's really going on here. As a result of the U.S. Census, they found uh, a lot of people left those districts over the last 10 years, and now uh, one of those seats may have to go. Yeah, based on some of the projections I've seen, both House District 91, which is represented by Representative London Lamar, and House District 90, which is represented by Tory Harris, um, lost about 10,000 people in population. And so given the growth of Middle Tennessee, it was likely that Shelby County was going to lose a seat in the legislature. And so what has happened, and this is according to Representative Harris, who told me this earlier this week, that he has been drawn, his house, which is in Midtown Memphis, I want to identify it, um, has been drawn into um, London Lamar's district. And so that means he does not have a seat to go run for in 2022. And so what's going to happen with that? He said that he's planning on moving into another district, not Representative Lamar's district, and running against some incumbent there. And so right now, we have some people who are upset and agitated. I mean, to Representative Harris expressed disappointment. He has been one of, and this is you know bipartisan. People tell me he has done a very good job down there, Republicans and Democrats. And now all of a sudden, as the young one of the youngest members of the General Assembly, he's finding himself without a district. All right, so we'll see where that ends up. Otis, it, it always gets interesting, and Democrats get all in a fuss about all of this. But the bottom line is. The numbers of Democrats or voters who identify as such is dwindling in Tennessee. There was a point when they used to have a majority in both state houses and the governor's office, that's but uh, those days are long gone. That, that's true, and, and they control redistricting when that happened uh, every 10 years. But for the last, since uh, 2010, it's been the Republicans. Uh, and this time, it just appears that the Republicans are trying to do everything they can, uh, whether it's uh, by spite or just because they can, uh, to increase their numbers. They already have a supermajority, but that's, that's what they're doing here. Uh, you have to wonder 
whether uh, you know they are intentionally trying to to, to get rid of Tory Harris uh, because uh, you know he de he defeated uh, 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 I can't remember his name now, but it, um, John DeBerry. Uh, John DeBerry. Yeah, DeBerry. John, yeah, yeah, John John DeBerry, who was very popular with Republicans. Uh, so I mean, there oh, there may okay. be a lot of political. Uh, shenanigans going on here. Uh, Say but it isn't so. Nah, well, I mean, this is the legislature <laughs> after all. Uh, but I think the Rich. overall issue here was a lack of transparency. We talked about that in the other segment. Uh, and that's uh, showing its ugly head here because there is not enough transparency here. The public has a right to know what's going on before the final decisions are made. Right. Uh, and Reverend Kent, before we go, I, I know you wanted to weigh in on the uh, public service uh, for young Dolph uh, that happened this week at FedEx Forum and also the renaming at least a portion of the street there uh, in the Castelia Heights neighborhood where he lived. And let's start by just quickly listening from, for all purposes, the widow of young Dolph, Mia Jay, and what she had to say this week. He was the most brilliant man, intelligent man, unique man, charming man. He was just everything. And I'm so, so blessed to have been able to experience him for nearly a decade. Obviously sad, uh, very sad uh, time for her, but Reverend Wamley, you were struck by some other things she said. She was a very articulate, very, very bright young woman, beautiful children. She said something a little bit later in her, in her speech that really struck me. She reached out to the young men and women in Castalia, and she urged them to strive to be like King David in the Bible. That, that just shocked me. She said they should strive to take care of their children, take care of their communities, and strive to be men and women after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of spirit that young Dolph had, obviously, with the results of his uh, uh, ph philanthropic work and the things that he had done in Memphis and Shelby County. But this young woman, had a, a really, really deep sense of gravitas. And I think young people in Memphis are listening to her. And somehow, I think it may lead to uh, less crime, less violence, and more buy-in by the people who live in the streets of Memphis who are really responsible for taking our community forward, man. All right, I hope I you're hope right. So. We'll take a break, we'll be right back. TitleMax offers two ways to get you the holiday cash you need. Get cash using your car title. Go to TitleMax.com, enter your car year, make, model. See how much you can get. TitleMax also offers flexible lines of credit. No title required. Check out TitleMax.com when you need more cash. Check out TitleMax.com, shop us for eight. Get up to $2,500 without your car title or up to $6,500 with your car title. And you'll say, I got my title back with TitleMax. Get your title back with TitleMax. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, it's time to go. Dad, we have to go back to Lowe's. <laughs> Dad, the tire! Is it? Yeah. The holidays begin at Lowe's, where you'll find all you want during Winterfest. Uh, carolers? Let's go back to Lowe's. Yeah, you're celebrating, make DBL a part of your holiday cheer. Erica's dressed like it's Friday. I'm, I'm like dressed like yeah. it's tax I'm attorney like. Monday. <laughs> we just go have a little bit of joy. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. DBL is always all new every day. Wonder whose arms will hold you good and tight. Join host Ryan Seacrest with Rosalind Sanchez, Billy Porter, Liza Koshy, and Sierra for Dick Clark's New Year's Rockin' Eve with Ryan Seacrest, live on ABC. The email is rransom at abc24.com, rransom at abc24.com. My thanks to my panel and to you at home for being with us. We'll see you next week for ABC 24 This Week. Injured, call 683-7000 and let NST Strong help you get paid. We buy any car. We buy any car. We buy any car. Any, 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 any. Did you know trading in your car at a dealer could cost you money? A recent study found consumers who trade in their car pay an average of $990 more. So don't trade in. Sell it.
to We Buy Any Car. Learn more and get your free online valuation now at WeBuyAnyCar.com. Find out how much your car's worth at WeBuyAnyCar. What should we do? I'm going to CashNetUSA.com. I can apply in minutes, and if approved, we can have the money as soon as the same business day. Go to CashNetUSA.com to apply for the money you need. Stay prepared with the Mid-South's most accurate forecast.